Roto Grinders NFL Food for Thought Podcast. We're in the thick of it. NFL playoff season. Simultaneously, there's a bunch of coaching changes and GM hirings and a lot of rumors floating around the league. An exciting time to be a football fan here. Thanks for tuning in another week. I am the Looch, joined by my co-host, the Chief, Will Priester. What's going on over there, Will? How are you? Nothing much, man. Another day in the office. Another day in paradise. You know, you get to uh, do sports for a living. I've been, you know, doing sports my whole life. So, you know, a good chunk of it via playing sports. And uh, now this chunk of it, being able to analyze and talk about sports, I get to live my my dream every day. So uh, glad to come on and uh, yet again talk about what is happening in the NFL, make a couple predictions, and uh, hopefully this show doesn't go off the rails with fandom, but we shall see. It's hard to follow up and act like Rob Coakley, who we had on last week, because he dubbed himself as the most handsome man in the in the D- Daily Fantasy Sports industry. Self-proclaimed, <laughs> right? We had self-proclaimed. The Shout out to Rob, Rob, though. He was a lot of fun. Um, but this week, we got another great guest on. Alpha Dog Sports Bets is what you might know him by in the social media sports betting world. Check him out on Twitter. Uh, and we go way back. I've known this guy since we were in college playing FIFA on Wednesday nights together on the <laughs> Xbox and probably doing a lot of things that uh, were, are better made or suited for a Joe Rogan podcast. But uh, he's he's a fantastic sports better, super sharp. My guy, Alpha Dog, here. I'm so glad that you're a part of the Scores and Odds team with the Chief and I and the rest of the crew. And thank you for finally joining us here. Of course, when the Giants are on some kind of Cinderella run, you want to come on the podcast. <laughs> exactly, exactly. When the Giants are good, that's when you're going to hear the most out of me. But I want to thank you guys for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. And Mr. Luch, you are correct about that. We go way back, my friend. What is it, 10 years now that we've been playing FIFA and talking shop about sports So excited we get to do that in a professional setting now i know we used to do this just sitting around the couch for free so it's fun getting to do this now and chop it up and i'm excited to dive into the slate speaking of the giants i got a lot to say about that so excited to get into that game with you guys in a little bit yeah it's it's been a an awesome couple of weeks and i mean obviously we're gonna you know we only have a couple games to talk about and then look ahead to the excitement uh for the next couple of days so chief I'll, i'll let you set the table here Looking back at last week's super wild card weekend, and pretty much everything lived up to the bill except, you know, America's game, Tom Brady versus Dallas, was uh, a total flop. So we don't even have to get into that right away. But backtrack with me. Let's set the table with something maybe from Saturday. Uh, I want to tell you right now, I think the Bills are done. Uh, they're in trouble. Like, I, I watched that game. I watched a couple games before that. And – you know, I already felt like Josh Allen hasn't really been the same since that elbow injury. Uh, some of his numbers took a dip, you know, kind of after the injury, so forth and so on. And it's not that his numbers weren't good, but let's just be honest here. We all expect that the Dolphins to take a pounding. And it's yeah. not like they were in Miami. They, they were in Buffalo. And don't look now, folks. The score was 34-31. Now, I'm not one of these people that overreacts to what we think is a bad team because I am in the camp that every NFL team is probably a fraction. The best team is probably not as much better as the the worst team outside of coaching, right? So coaching matters, and I think we see that even in Miami. But you, you can't let a Skylar Thompson Miami Dolphin team – lose by three points like you 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 just can't and so this i may be in the minority here but i don't i don't see how the bills get close to the super bowl like yeah the Bengals were at home they played the ravens if the ravens had lamar jackson do they win uh maybe the ravens defense is much better than the, the bills defense or the dolphins defense like they're variables to each matchup that you know we have to include but I don't see the Bills right now as a better team than the Bengals or the Chiefs. I, I just – I don't see that. They they may, in fact, have struggled with the Jaguars if, it, if they had to play them this week. So, and, you know, 
I, and I don't think this is an overreaction. Like the Bills have been trending this way for weeks now, but they just kept winning. I, I don't I don't see how the Bills get to the Super Bowl. I, I think they get they may get put out this week. Like seriously. Follow up on that, Alpha. I don't want to see that, but I, I definitely agree with everything that you said about the Bills. I mean, you watched that game last week, and they look like a team that they're starting to try and figure it out again. They've had so many things that have happened to them. They're trying to get back into their rhythm, and it's hard to get back into that rhythm at this time of the year. I think you put it perfectly. That defense gave up 31 points to Skylar Thompson, and they were missing their running back. They are missing Mostert. So the Dolphins really didn't have all their weapons, not the quarterback, didn't have the running back. They still scored 31 points, so – the defense of Buffalo is a little scary. I, in that game, was on the Dolphins team total under four, uh, 15 and a half. So you guys know how that one went. They scored 31 points. I was shocked by the score of that game. But going over to this week again, like you kind of said, um, it's interesting against the Bengals team. Um, I could definitely see the Bills losing this week. I'm going to be honest as well. I thought they were going to have a much better showing. All the emotion. They're back at home. First game home since the incident. And they come out and play like that. So I'm not very confident in them. And to me, that was just the craziest game from that first – from the opening weekend was probably that Bills-Dolphins game because it was the most unexpected in my opinion. Can, can I just put one other little thing out there in the atmosphere before we get to that part? Like, go get – just go get the Bengals plus five and a half right now. Like, I think they're going to win this game straight up. Just just go grab it right now. This, this is insane. Like, there's no way – the Bengals should be plus, like if it was plus two and a half, okay. Like I understand Buffalo's at home, you're giving them a field goal. N- no way can this team be favored plus five. Just stop it. Like just stop it. Are you buying the hook up to six or are you going to take it to five and a half? Five and a half is probably my limit. But, yeah. but if I think they win, I really just need to take them all. I can I can just take anything. Like seriously, I think they win this game straight up. Like, then you have a lot of insurance there. I can see it happening too, and I think that the line is absolutely crazy. But when the line is that crazy, right? Doesn't it kind of make you think? Well, maybe this is then the game the Bills are going to win by ninety because the line is the way it is. So the line sometimes tells a big story, and we saw that in the opening game. Luch, what do you think the line tells you about in this one? When you well, see looking- Buffalo really struggle. And they're coming in five and a half point favorites at home versus a Bengals team that they didn't look great themselves against Baltimore. I, I have two two conversations that are like kind of separate, but also the same. I guess my first one is just about the Bills. I didn't think I'd be saying it depends on the play of Josh Allen. And Mike, I never thought that would be the deal breaker for me. And I am wondering how are we seeing regression from Josh Allen who led the NFL interceptions in the regular season and I or or and I talked about this on a podcast at some point this season is he just kind of going through like I don't want to call this Patrick Mahomes syndrome but a couple of years ago Mahomes just borderline refused to take what the defense would give him more oftentimes than not and just force everything and then he kind of matured and of course it really helps to have Andy Reid and Eric Benemini um at your side to kind of talk things through. And uh, of course, when you don't have your obnoxious wife and brother all over social media this season, that probably helps too. I'm just kidding. Kind of, but we haven't heard from them much this year. So I agree with that. Um, So, and Mahomes has really evolved as a quarterback, I think even more. And of course you get rid of Tyreek and he's still throwing for bajillion yards and he's pretty damn efficient. So, so what's up with Josh Allen? Like, I don't think the elbow injury affects his decision-making. And of course, when Josh Allen, this could be like a third conversation, LJ, when Josh Allen first came in the league, boy, was he raw. I remember that playoff game against Houston where he'd make three great plays and, you know, one terrifying play. And now people are making like Daniel Jones comps with him. When Daniel Jones came in the league, he we see the athleticism, we see the dual threat, we see. I mean, of course, he doesn't have the the rocket arm that Allen has, but he he has a pretty damn good arm, and um, that we can save that conversation for a couple minutes from now. But I don't I don't know exactly what I'm getting out of Josh Allen. I, what I do know is like this game against Miami was much closer than it should have been. You have the freak, you know, f- the fumble recovery, um, 
like you look at all the numbers and Buffalo really dominated everything that matters. They picked up 25 first downs um, to Miami 16. Miami, or, uh, Miami was just four for 16 on third down. Buffalo was nine for 16 uh, p- yards per play. I mean, Miami was terrible. Miami was terrible. Three, 3.9 uh, passing yards to play. Buffalo picked up 6.9 uh, yards per play through the air. It just came down to the turnovers. It came down to Josh Allen, who threw two picks and uh, lost a fumble. And you throw in that freak play, uh, you can't do that in the playoffs. So, like, I don't want to say the line is right because I, I like the Bengals. I like Joey Bengals. I like the weapons. I think they're good enough on both sides of the ball. I think Zach Taylor's a pretty good coach. Um, so I'm looking at scores and odds, and this line opened up at four. It's now five and a half like we talked about. And right now, 33% of the bets are on Buffalo, but 65% of the money is on that five and a half. So that's interesting. However, a lot of the money hasn't been right the last couple of weeks. And LJ, I know you track that a lot. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. Absolutely. What's up with that's that? why that's why immediately I said when the line tells you if the line feels a little off right now, that's the line you have to be playing. It, it just the way in the NFL works in the playoffs. And this one to me is just too many points, and I think that you have to take the Bengals in the spot. Like we said earlier, I think this should be a two-and-a-half, three, maybe three-and-a-half point line, but it's all the way up at a five-and-a-half. I would honestly buy it at six at minus 120. I like having that little insurance there. Anytime if I can get that extra hook for 10 cents, I'm going to take it. But I agree with you there. I think that the line is very telling in this one, and because it should be a three, three-and-a-half point line, and because of everything that's been going on with the Bills and everything we've been seeing in the games – I agree with you guys. I think that the Bengals actually win this one outright. But I'm still going to take the security, buy it up to six, which is crazy if you think a team's going to win outright. But I kind of feel the same way I do about the – as I did with the Giants versus Minnesota last week, as I do about the Bengals here. Playoff Bengals are just a different beast in general. And I think we're definitely going to see that on, in this matchup play out. Chief, got anything else there? It, it's just a really weird game to handicap. And I think it, I just think it comes down to how sloppy Josh Allen's been. I mean, we've seen turnover. many multiple turnover games out of him. And, and you mentioned the injury. And you know what? We could all look like fools if he plays a clean game and they win by 18. I mean, it's, I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but like they gave Miami three extra possessions and that freak play turned it into a one score game. You know, if you take that fumble recovery off the scoreboard and they win by like nine or 10, we're probably not having this discussion. It's amazing what a difference a touchdown can, uh, you know, how it can change the perception of, of, uh, of the public, I guess. And um, yeah, just a weird line. And I, I'm not sure I'm willing to follow the money at the, at, you know, right now, like you're saying LJ either. Um I don't know if I'm going to force any action on this one. But anyway, Chief, go ahead. I didn't mean to just ramble. Oh, no, no. Yeah, so, so I guess the thing for me is I just think the Bengals are a better team. Like, just – just I'm saying that. If you would ask me this week three, of course I'm taking the Bills, right? But we're not in week three. We're in the divisional round, and the Bengals have essentially been on, on an incline since probably week eight, I would say. Like – they that's pretty much been their traje- trajectory, even with uh, Jamar Chase being out for like four or five games. Like they've still been on an upward swing, and I just, I I think I think this is the Bills. Like if, I feel like they're stuck now. Of course, obviously Von Miller being out of that defense has hurt their pass rush. You know when they get by, when they get teams on the ropes, like they don't have that elite guy that can just say. No matter how, how much you double me and try to, you know, chip me on the outside, I, I'm going to get to the court. They don't have that. Like, you know, they've got some good pieces, but this is going to be, you know, what I consider to be a, a, a heavyweight fight for them. And then I'm just going to parlay this. So glad DeMar is doing okay. You know, it's, it's a repeat. This is going to be an emotional game. I get that. Um, the Bills are at home. Another sidebar, and this just kind of, kind of tells you all the stuff I look at just to get ready for one game. God, just so much information. I, it's supposed to be cold, but it's supposed to get a little bit of snow. It's supposed to get a little bit of wind. Like, we'll we'll see how, how it goes. But I just think the Bengals are a better team. I, I think they've got better weapons across the board. And we've seen games where Stefan Diggs just disappeared. Now, not by his choice. 
because if they don't throw him the ball, he's going to go and argue with McDermott and say, look, get me the ball. But we've seen games where he goes from 10, 11 targets down to like six targets. Well, if this is one of those games, they lose. I'm telling you right now. Like they're done. I don't see that happening. But if it gets to that, if you're telling me Stefan Diggs takes – 40% dip in his market share in the passing game, I'm immediately going to hand this to the Bengals. Immediately. Well, and, and I guess lastly is, if I'm going to defend Josh Allen at all, one of the biggest disappointments in the fantasy sports industry, I think specifically best ball, and people were chasing this guy all year in DFS and everything, is Gabe Davis was supposed to be that guy to make life easier. He was supposed to take this leap. We saw the big opening week, right? He went crazy, caught a couple touchdowns. And uh, what do you have, 800 yards this year, less than 50 catches? So it sounds ridiculous, but Gabe Davis is not consistently reliable. Dawson Knox is just a red zone threat. After Stephon Diggs, your life's not that hard. If you stay over the top of Diggs, I know you got some formidable backs and Singletary and – uh, James Cook, that's fine. Neither of them are, are super explosive. They're split in time. So maybe Josh Allen's forced to force things a little more than he's been. The Ga- Gabe Davis is the public favorite. Everyone loves the guy. He's fast. He runs straight down the field. But, like, it's just not working. So They want Gabe Davis to be Mike Evans, and he's yeah. not Mike Evans. Like, that, that's let's just call it what it is. Mike it's crazy Evans to say, Chief. It's guy. crazy to say, Chief, but maybe Josh Allen doesn't have a ton of help outside of the digs, right? Am I crazy for saying that, guys? I don't think uh, you are. Can't, I don't think you are. I think that's a weakness. Okay, right. so I, I guess this is – man, I, this, this is good This is good today. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So I'm going to use Aaron Rodgers as a reference because oh, this is about Aaron Rodgers, okay? <laughs> if you listen to this podcast, you guys know how I feel about Aaron. I think he's overrated. But – this is not about Aaron. It's about the comparison, right? So we've done this thing where we've kind of tried to give Aaron Rodgers the Brady treatment. He's not Tom Brady, right? So we can't it's, – it's really more like apples and oranges to apples and apples. Great talent, but come on. He, he's not Tom. Tom's not, Tom's not the most, let's call it talented, but Tom's a better quarterback, Okay. I think because Josh Allen is in the Patrick Mahomes era, we want to see him play like Mahomes, but but he's not Mahomes. Because if we compare them straight up, Josh Allen has better weapons than Mahomes. Mahomes doesn't have a true number one receiver. He's got Travis Kelsey, who's a tight end, but he's Travis Kelsey's not Stephon Diggs. Do you get what I'm saying? I mean, half of the game, listen, half of the game, Patrick Mahomes is throwing to Watson. Juju Smith Schuster, uh, uh, Marqu- Marquez Valdez Scantley. Th- those don't sound like any crazy receivers that I'm worried about. But he still has 300 yards passing almost every game. So, I, I mean, he's resurrected Jarek McKinnon's whole career. Like just this season, Jarek McKinnon now has a, a whole new career. I think we're trying to give him the Mahomes viewpoint, but he's not Mahomes, right? So. Does he need more help? No, I think he needs to use what he's got. Stop trying to force the ball down the field and run the ball and take it when they give it to you and reset up and save the play for another day. Don't try to pick up a third and nine with a 40-yard pass down the field. If they're in man coverage and, you, you know, you send a hot route, turn their backs and run, just run. Get the first down and let's move on to the, ne- to the next series of plays. I think that's what's going on, Josh Allen. It's not Mahomes. I think we've tried to maybe – Compare him with Mahomes, and that, that's not him. He's got to be his own guy and get it done his way. And right now, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to put put the team on his back and carry them past the Bengals. Bengals plus five and a half. You heard it here first from the pod. I expect the scores and odds right up from both of you. Thank you. <laughs> get it. All right. Let's talk about uh, – the Jags and the Chargers. I, I know we got to get out of here a little bit sooner than later today. Whoa, where do you start with this one? Where do you start with this one? Did you guys like stop paying attention and come back? And like, so uh, Alpha, what could you believe that meltdown from the Chargers? I actually could not. 
I could not. I was at a bar with a buddy of mine who is a massive Chargers fan. And what an absolute disaster. What a tale of two halves. And what a collapse. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, what was it, four interceptions in the first half? Completely turned it around. The guy was absolutely electric after that. And the Chargers just do what the Chargers do. I mean, I'm not saying that I believe in Trevor Lawrence and the Jags. But what's a great comeback? It, to me, it was more about how bad the Chargers are. You can't go up 27 points in the playoffs and blow the game. Terrible performance by them. Staley has to go, in my opinion, but they scapegoated, fired the offensive coordinator. Just the Chargers being what the Chargers are. What did you guys think of the game? I, I think I'm going to close it out. I'm not going to say much about this game. I'm literally going to use your last statement. And it's it's so bad that when we say this, Everybody agrees across the whole United States. What we saw was the Chargers being the Chargers. I'll leave it at that. Staley still has a job, and I think Herbert's alliance with him is probably keeping it. But you're right. That's what the Chargers do, and we talked about it countless times. They don't close out games. They they seem, quote-unquote, soft. They're just missing something. Something strange and ridiculous. But, hey, kudos to the Jags for not rolling over. You're down by a million. And the culture and the identity has changed. Doug Peterson doing big things, cleaning up after a complete disaster. Yep. What pressure uh, that front office Jacksonville is on to turn things around, not ruin Trevor Lawrence, to bring in the right guy. Not only do you flip the culture, but you win a freaking playoff game, and, and there's a chance. Playing with house money now. Now there's a chance for more. Not only do you win a playoff game, you win a win and in game against Tennessee, who, listen, they should have cleaned against Tennessee and Josh Dobbs. Let's Ooh. be real. So they're really riding hot right now, which is uh, which is awesome for them. Uh, before we – well, I guess we'll just segue that in with the Chiefs. Let's just segue that in with one the Chiefs second. game this week. Can, we, can I say one more thing about the Chargers before we move? You can say three more things, five more things. Cool. I, I just want to talk about – like the string of what I feel like has been Chargers misfortune, if you will. I'm going to go down these list of coaches. And so, so something is going on with the Chargers organization. I don't know if it's the front office. I don't know if it's ownership. I don't know if a black cat's running around there. But I'm going to I'm gonna rattle off these coaches. And then you're going to basically see that it's been the same result for the Chargers. For like a day. Marty Schottenheimer, same results. North Turner, same results. Mike McCoy, same results. Anthony Lynn, same results. And now we're at Brandon Staley. Like n- n- literally, they've had great quarterback play. They've had Phillip Rivers for like half of that run. They've had LT for part of that run. They've had Antonio Gates for a part of that run. I mean, they've had Keenan Allen for a part of that run with, with Phillip. And now they're at Herbert and Eckler and Allen and Mike Will. They've had weapons the whole time. And they've literally had the same result for like all these years. This is this is incredible. Like it's actually impressive that they're this good and this bad at the same time every year. It's actually impressive. Yeah. At least they're consistent. They're consistently going to break your heart every year. One of my closest friends is a Charger fan. And this dude has been through hell and back. He's at the bar the other night. They're up 27-0. We're ordering appetizers. We're getting more drinks. Everyone's vibing. It's a good time. He's going to win. Chargers are going to win. We all bet the Chargers with him. And slowly but surely, the Chargers are doing exactly what you said. They're doing the Chargers. And the mood and the environment in the bar just kept going like this, down and down and down. And the score just kept closing and closing and closing until the Chargers went full charge. Well, I'd like to say this: like you gotta you gotta make changes to the defensive team, the defensive coordinators, the whole nine. You have a defense on paper that features Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, Derwin James, and Asante Samuel, and you just get beat up week after week, and you give up a bajillion second half points to the to the Jaguars, one of the biggest meltdowns of all time. I mean, it works both ways. The offense got sustained drives. I get it. But the, the the organization is not getting 
enough out of their players. And like, where do you start pointing fingers with that? Top down, man. Start at the top. Um, segue that in with the Chiefs. You know, coming off a bye, eight and a half point spread here. The money's on the Jags. Everyone's drinking the Kool Aid. I know you guys know I'm a Titans fan, but I really think Kansas City puts the hammer down here. I'm not saying it's going to be a blowout, but I think they win by 10. Yeah, I can see that for sure. My favorite angle on this game is definitely going to be the over. Uh, We all saw what that Jaguars defense is capable of in the first half. We saw what their offense is capable of in the second half. And we all know the Achilles heel of the Chiefs is that defense. Their offense is going to put up a million points. But can they keep the other team each week? from putting up a million points. That's always the story you're going to get with the Kansas City Chiefs and the way they play. And this one, the total sitting at 52 and a half. I think we're going to see this game closer to 60, if not surpass that 60 point total. We're going to see a lot, a lot of points. So my actual favorite play of the weekend is going to be the over in this matchup. Yeah. And chief, if you like Kansas City with the lead, you know, the Jaguars are going to have to keep pace and throw the ball. And as good as Lawrence has been yet, he's not perfect either. You know, it could be, uh, could be a couple of uh, sloppy touchdowns trying to play catch up one way or the other. And uh, I know we're, we just were bashing about following the money, but a ton of the money, meaning like over 90% is on the over here. Um, that's when I start taking it a little more seriously. So my big thing with the money percentages is with the totals, I don't look too big into it until the day before-ish because you'll see a lot of money coming the day before. The yeah. spreads are where I like to hammer early with the money. But if we're looking at terms of just the money – I like to look at that the day before the actual game compared to a little bit early. With spreads, I like to look at it as early as possible because you're going to see big betters come in. You're going to see big wages placed. So you're going to see some movement that way and good, get a good indication. But with totals, you'll see a lot of that market hit a little bit later in the week. So until then, we have a little bit of time to panic about that 90%. We have another day. Go ahead, Chief. Well, you know me, man. I, I, I'm heavy in the prop streets. And props don't move as much as other things, but – I try to kind of get a feel of the game in my mind virtually, like when I'm looking, when I'm kind of looking at props. And so, you know, right now, uh, Patrick Mahomes, I think he opened them. And let me check. I'm, I'm almost positive. He opened over 300 this game. I think um, I haven't, I haven't dug it yet. Like, well, he's at three ten and a half right now, three eleven and a half on DK. Like, and Trevor Lawrence is sitting at 250, 251 and a half. Like, that, that should tell you what you need to know. And so then you sit back and you say, well, you know, are, are they going to hit these numbers? Well, I'm here to tell you, I've taken so many Patrick Mahomes half overs in terms of his passing yards this year. He's typically around 160, first half, right? 160, 160. some games he'll hit 200, but typically he's going to hit you around, hit you for around 160 in the first half. And if you think, and, and this is what I what I think about this game, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be in a similar situation, but with a closer score this game. Well, why why is that important? Well, Patrick Mahomes is going to keep throwing the ball. We've seen the, the Chiefs get up, let's say, 14, 17 points. We've actually seen Pacheco pick up a few more carries and McKinnon pick up a few more carries. But if it's a three-point game, a seven-point game, Mahomes is not slowing down, which is going to – keep pushing the pace of this game. And so it all ties in. The over ties in. The overpass yards ties in. And then you get some of these receiver props where they're like hanging around 48 and a half, 49 and a half, 50 and a half. You, you get that and you say, well, well if they're going to keep throwing, let's just take some overs. And it's not hard to kind of put together these four and five leg parlays that make tons of sense. So for me, you know, I think the, the only thing I needed to see was Trevor Lawrence at 250, 249 and a half. Like that, that's an over central game to me because historically over the season, Trevor Lawrence has been sitting around 225, 230. Like that's yeah. that's where he's been. So I like the overs here. I like I like Trevor's over, I like Mahomes' over. And I think um for Trevor, it depends on where they kind of end up. But one of these guys is going to get the ball at the end of half and give them an extra 30, 40 yards, and one's going to have it at the end of the game that gives them an extra 30, 40 yards. And that's how football goes. That's why I'm taking the overs here. Just wanted to add that little tidbit since we you know, we were plugging in some of that, that little data. I just want to give you my, my, my reasoning behind how I make certain decisions. Love it. Well, I'll give you the floor here, Alpha, and you can talk to me about the Giants-Vikings game and then what you're – 
unbiased thoughts are against the birds this coming week. Absolutely. You know, it's always unbiased for me when it's coming about my G-men, but what a performance by Daniel Jones. No, first and foremost against the Vikings, the guy looked like one of the top 10 quarterbacks in the league. I'm not going to be like other Giants fans that are claiming that he's looked like a top three quarterback, a top five quarterback. He's looked very good. He's looked very good. And he's made a lot happen with a little bit of talent around him. He has Saquon around him, which is a ton of talent. But besides Saquon, the drop-off after Saquon at the skill positions is ridiculous. Throwing to guys like Hodgins, who's been on the practice squad for three years at Buffalo. Guys like Richie James, who you know, who's been a journeyman his whole career, a kick returner. You know, he's making guys into players that have never been these kind of players before in their career. And that defense is playing some good football now that they got a Dory Jackson back and Xavier McKinney on the defensive side. They got their corners, their safeties back. And they're playing tough football. That being said, it is going to be an extremely tough matchup this week against the Eagles. It's a completely different style against the Vikings. Before the Giants-Vikings game, you had a good indication of how that game was going to go because the defensive line of the Vikings was not great, and the Giants' offensive line was able to hold up against the Vikings' defensive line. Different story in Philadelphia this week. Philly, to me, is the best defensive line of football going up against the Giants. Daniel is not going to have the same time to make those passes. He's not going to have the same time to roll out. So they're going to have a little bit different game plan. I think they're going to have to run the ball a lot more. Saquon only had seven carries against Minnesota. We're not going to see the same kind of style here. I think we'll see a 20-carry game out of him. But these New York Giants are reminding me of the uh, you know mid-early 2000 Giants, young Eli Manning coming in. They were five, six seeds, and they made some good runs. I think the spread in this game is too high. I will be at the stadium. I will be at the link in Philly screaming my head off Saturday at 8-15. But – I am taking the Giants to the plus eight at minus 120. I'm buying the hook here. I think it's too many points. Either way, I do think this is going to be a close game. And these teams are kind of trending in different directions. The Giants are kind of hitting their stride. Daniel is peaking at the right time. And Jalen's coming off a pretty, to me, serious injury concern. I'm not sure he's going to be 100%. It seems to me like Jalen Hurts kind of peaked at the beginning of the season. He was playing his best football in the early part of the season. And he's trying to regain that form while the Giants are currently in that form. So I would not be excited if I was an Eagles fan. I would be a little bit nervous. I think Big Blue can get it done. And that's my 50% bias, 50% non-bias opinion. <laughs> that's fair. Let me hop in here and I'll throw it over to Chief. Um, first of all, Daniel Jones would uh, beg to have Josh Allen's weapons, probably. You're absolutely right. And Chief and I have talked about in this podcast, the way to beat the Eagles is to run the football. I, the, the pass rush is great. You know, the linebackers are eh, a little bit iffy. Uh, out of all the playoff teams uh, that are left, Eagles are the worst. Or, I'm sorry, they are uh, an average run-stopping team. Um, the Giants run a lot of gap, and uh, I and uh, we'll see uh, how the Eagles can defend that. But I think we're going to get a heavy dose of Saquon, and uh, we'll see how that unfolds. Good. Chief, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, so... This is the weird game of the week for me, to be honest with you. Like, th- this is the one game where I think it could go either way. And it's 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 interesting because – so we saw the Eagles offense, in my opinion, take off earlier this season with A.J. Brown, right? Hurts running the football. And then, you know, we had this, this injury – to Hertz that's that pretty much sidelined him a few games at the end of the season. Uh, and then he comes back and he's playing a Giants team that pretty much is resting everyone. And then he's also playing conservative. They just want to win so they can keep the home field advantage. I think if I think that even this game, if they get more ball control than they have typically in the season, right? Like, less explosive plays, more ball control. I think that's their way to win this game. To put a little bit of pressure, like, let's say they can have an eight-minute drive, right, as an example, score a touchdown, the, because the Giants want to sustain drives too. But let's say the Giants have a three-, four-minute drive, but they can't put any points on the board, as an example. They go for maybe 30, 40 yards, and then they have to punt, okay? And then the Eagles have a six-minute drive, score a field goal. Giants get the ball back. They have a, you know, six play drive, minute and a half, you know, two minutes, whatever. Can't can't put any points on the board. Eagles then get the ball, have like a five minute drive, score a touchdown. Now we're sitting at second quarter, 
six minutes left. It's 17-0. And the Giants, have, at, at this point, have got to try to do something to score. So what are they going to do? They're going to play their best game script that they have, right? They're going to ensure that we get three, seven, something, but we got to have, we got to call our best spot of the game here. And we end the, we end the half at like 17, seven, right? So somewhere around there. Now, now I'm really afraid. Here's why the giants are playing with house money. Now, when they come back out, They've got they've got nothing to lose. You get what I'm saying? And the Eagles are just going to try to stay on schedule. And I know I'm kind of talking a lot of coach talk and football talk here, but the Eagles have to try to cover up Hurts' injury if he's still hurt enough to get him to the next week. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, well, I don't think we're going to see full blown Eagles explosive offense here. I think I they're not conservative, but dialing back just enough to get the try and get the win rather than risk his season. If that makes any sense. And I think that's why I'm, I'm so in, in between on this game because I'm, I'm just not sure how Hertz is actually going to play. Like for them to win, I think Hertz has got to run the ball 12 times. Is he going to run it 12 times? I don't, exactly. I don't know. You know what I think they're going to avoid? I heard this on, and I can't even take credit for this line because Booger McFarland, who I hate giving credit to anyway, was on ESPN yesterday, and he was saying if he was Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams, some of these big interior defensive linemen for the Giants, you get your hands on Jalen Hurts, you're falling on his shoulder. And he said, that's not dirty. That's just how the NFL works. In the playoffs, it's win at all costs. So if you know that you're the Eagles, you're going to really want to limit his carries because one fall by Dexter Lawrence, who's a, a million pounds right on your shoulder, that's going to knock – that's going to knock you out for the postseason if it's already tender and a bad uh, shoulder. So are they going to protect him by not running the ball 12 times a game like you say? And I think that they're going to need to run him 15 times. And if they have to do that, is he going to make it through the game? So there's a lot of variables with Hurts in this one. I agree with you 100%. And by instinct, though, he might just take off when he has to. And well, that could either be a good thing or a bad thing for betting on this game specifically. Well, to me, that's right. different. To, to, to me, that's different. Let me tell you why. Because the off script runs aren't what I'm talking about, actually. I know. I'm like they design quarterback draws, powers. Like you'll see a guard pull in and you know, oh, this is for this is for Jalen. Like t- taking that part of the game away, like you'll see them on third and three. They'll they'll just run basically uh uh a quarterback dive. Like you'll see, you'll see uh um, geez, one of their running backs basically hit the A gap to clear out space for him to get it. Like, I don't if if they don't have that element to their offense, like readily available, that's that's literally essentially changing their play calling on third and three. Like you're taking away, let's say, fifteen percent of their playbook for short down situations. Well, in football, that's a lot. If you think they're probably going to run uh, average, I'm assuming. Run about sixty plays. So if you if you're saying you're taking away ten to fifteen percent, that's six or seven plays. That's that's the difference between two or three first downs. Like I, it, I I'm really torn between how the Eagles are going to call this game. If if Jalen doesn't have the rushing upside as usual, because it is on his throwing shoulder, so he, he's got to throw the ball at some point. Like that that's the variable that I'm like, Ugh, it's so tough for me to read the game plan like i know what the jaguars game plan is going to be they're going to be setting up this week to run a whole lot of two minute drill because that's what it's going to feel like if they let this game get out of hand i know kind of how the bills are going to run run their game script i know how the Bengals are pretty much going to run their game script because unless unless something just stupid happens which i i pray it doesn't this game i'm i just i don't have a read on the game script per se, because this is going to be a different Jalen Hurts. This this is a Hurts we've seen for 13 weeks. Yep, yep, yep. And and in this spot, do you trust Nick Sirianni or do you trust Brian Dable? Who do you think is going to come out with a better coaching game plan for their team? Honestly, God, it it doesn't pain me to say this. I think the Giants are going to have a better game plan. They've They've played consecutive weeks. They haven't taken a break. They're in a groove. It's it's just a weird like this feels like when Luch, I don't know if you're I can't remember what week this was. It feels like the Eagles commanders all over again when the commanders were just kind of on this uptick and yeah. they had a game plan and they stuck with the game plan. And you looked at it in the game and you said, 
holy cow, the Eagles just lost to the Commanders. It wouldn't feel as shocking because clearly the Giants have been playing tremendously better, but it, it's got that that grindy feel to it. If if, if yeah. everybody can go back to that week where it's like, what in the world? I mean, the Giants, not the Giants. I think God, the Commanders might have run the ball so crazy. And hit them, and, and by the end of the game, they just wore that team out. And God, it, it could be like that. This game, see, now you got me thinking. The same way I took the the, uh, I might have to take the Giants plus seven and a half. I, I think you've convinced Come on me. Over here. The more I sat here and talked, Come it, through, on. It, it feels right though. Giants plus seven and a half. Yeah, you're, you're not going to many points. You're not gonna like this, LJ, but I I feel like the Eagles win, but the Giants cover. I I feel like it's gonna be a hard. I don't know. I feel like it's gonna be a twenty three twenty one game or like I I that the we can't discredit how good both sides of the Eagles line is offense and defense. And I just feel like I feel like maybe that's just uh, I mean it's a gut call just based on that. It sounds kind of dumb, but like I would expect Miles Sanders to get a ton of work this week. You know just based on everything we talked about. So uh, two former Penn State backs, you know, going up against each other. Kind Battling of cool. it out. And uh, I think it's going to be a great game. I think the door is definitely open for the Giants to win outright. I I, I just really uh, – I, I like getting the points there, but I still feel like the Eagles squeak it out maybe. But. I still – I do think the – I think the game is, is a toss-up. Truthfully, I think either team could really win, but I think the spread is outrageous. So I agree with you. I think the Eagles definitely have a chance to win this game. I think the Giants have a chance to win this game. But I think the seven and a half is going to be perfect. Yeah, uh, we covered a lot of ground here, and so another game where the money was on Seattle and the points. Um, I know Alpha has to depart soon, but if you want to give us your take on the Forty Nine ers in general, um, last week the money uh, was on Seattle and the points. Forty Nine ers and the 49ers made a pretty good statement, if you see what I did there. So oh you're buying God. into Brock Purdy and the Niners. What are your thoughts? So I've been saying this all year long, all year long, that the 49ers to me are the most complete team in the NFC. And another point about the NFC, man, the NFC has completely flipped it this year. To me, the NFC is scarier than the AFC, which is saying something when you see the team is on that side, but that's not the point here. That San Francisco defense is legit. Legit, legit, legit. And then Kyle Shanahan offense, all he does is design easy throws for Brock, simple plays for CMC. And the simplicity of that offense is beautiful. Like, you, there's no other way to say how simple and, and efficient that offense is with Debo back. That team is dynamic. I personally was on the Seahawks with the points last week. I ate that one. I was screaming at halftime. We were looking good. They played a great half, the Seahawks. And the second half, the 49ers just, that just showed you what they do. So, I think the Niners are going to get it done for, for, against the Cowboys this week. It's scary with the three and a half points, though. So, I, I, with saying that, I do think the Niners are going to win this game, but I'm betting Dallas plus the three and a half because I do not think that either of these teams win it by more than three. So, I think we see this one end on a last second field goal. We end this one close within that three point range, but it does end within the plus three and a half. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned to Chief earlier that the Eagles have dropped to. Uh, worse than five to one to win the Super Bowl. Is that the 49ers effect or is that the Hurts injury? 49ers effect, in my opinion. The, the defense is just playing out of their mind. They've been all year long. And Brock Purdy has the offense looking like any other quarterback who's been there for them. It, it, they haven't lost a beat with him being in the game. Except Trey Lance. <laughs> yeah, they, that looks worse. It's only worse. So congratulations, Luke. You're going to love him in Tennessee next year. Uh, ha, just kidding. There are some rumors flying, but we will see about that. Yeah, hey, I know you got to get out of here. Um, so me and Chief will talk about uh, some coaching changes and things like that. But uh, thank you for joining us today, man. We, we appreciate it. Appreciate you guys having me. If the Giants uh, win this week, you better expect me to come back because I'm, I'm one of those uh, superstitious guys. So the Giants are winning. I'm going to be back to tell you they're going to win again. And thank you guys for having me. Hey, drop your Twitter handle real quick and uh, and what you do. Absolutely. Alpha Dog Bets at Alpha Dog Bets on Twitter. If you guys don't know who I am, give out daily sports picks with a New York kind of flavor to them. So if you guys like any of that stuff, come check me out. I'm also on scoresandodds.com. Yes, you are. And I expect a couple write ups out of you, sir. Please and thank you. Anyway, good luck to your G men this week. Have fun at the link. Don't get in any trouble over there. I will try my best, my friend. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Alpha. Take it easy.
Chief, uh, the 49ers, man, I mean, they keep doing their thing. And I, I, I'm i just so impressed with what they've built. John Lynch and company. And, of course, uh, Alpha made a joke here. Tennessee signed uh, Rand Carthon as their GM, which I think is amazing. Anybody from the 49ers tree uh, coming over uh, makes me happy here. Just please don't. Just please don't bring me Trey Lance. Um, but wow, you gotta love what the Niners uh, have been doing here. How, can, this, like, if they keep winning, that kind of just throws out the. Well, you need a franchise quarterback to win a Super Bowl, and I don't think the odds of Brock Purdy turning into Peyton Manning are great. I think maybe he's serviceable. He's in a fantastic system. The system also made Jimmy Garoppolo look fantastic before he got hurt. Um, it did so, not make Trey Lance look fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot to lot to unravel here. You, you see, like dang, like so, so, so. Here's my question, because look, and we've seen this before. Um, you know, a late round quarterback can be good in this league. Now, does that mean he's going to be elite? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I don't think Brock Purdy is going to be elite by like he. And what I'm saying is he's not going to throw for 300 yards a game and three touchdowns, but he doesn't have to. All Brock Purdy has to do is make the right decision, which essentially, Luch, is what any quarterback has to do, but coaches can't open up the playbook when a quarterback is in elite talent. Does that You get what I'm saying? Like when you've got Patrick Mahomes, you can maybe add in a few more wrinkles that in, in otherwise you may not would have been able to do due to this quarterback's limitations or that quarterback's limitations, so forth and so on. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, I think, is this a tribute to Kyle Shanahan's coaching? Absolutely. But I don't want to diminish Brock Purdy's ability to make good decisions because that's what you have to do in this offense. Make the right read, get the ball out on time. What we saw in this past game against Seattle is, he was able to make some of the off-schedule throws where the place collapsed, the, the defensive uh, end is in your face, and now you've got to get outside of the pocket or extend some plays. Make, like we saw it with uh, a touchdown that he made to, uh, to Eli Mitchell. He had to extend that play to put them in a position to, to get that going. Well, if he's going to play like that, hint, hint, now – He's playing a different style of football. Do, do you get what I'm saying? It's he's not just sitting there and 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 taking a hit, or he he's he's playing with a little imagination. Let's call it that. And if he can do that in this offense, I will tell you right now, Brock Purdy starts next season. And if he plays well next season, as an example, they'll give him an extension. And they may not have to pay him what all the other top quarterbacks are paying, but he won't care. They just want to win football games. Do you get what I'm saying, Luke? Imagine if they win this week and he plays well. By well, I mean 240 passing, two or three touchdowns, maybe an exception, but doesn't cost not a costly one. Maybe it's one in the first quarter or something where ball gets tipped and it's okay. If he wins this game and he's got the numbers to back it up and you see the progression, the development still going, there's no way – they'll be able to not name him the starter for next season. They've already got a good thing going. No need to shake it up. I think they're the favorite to come out of the NFC, and that's no discredit to the Eagles. But stylistically, I think it's a very fascinating matchup if the Eagles do beat the Giants. And I don't – and I think the Giants are playing fantastic, but I wouldn't feel confident in them – uh, heading to the bay, and if my math, <laughs> if, if my math is right here, uh, how would it match up? Wait, would they get that? Da- where would Dallas fall into this? Uh, nowhere if the Niners beat them. So, <laughs> uh, that's you know, do you have a take on the Niners Dallas game? I, I think, I think the 49ers win. Um, you know, we saw Dallas. I think. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Luke. We saw them absolutely lay the hammer down in Tampa Bay. And uh, so, yeah, tell me about Niners, Dallas, and then if you want to talk about Tom Brady and company, go for it. 
I think this is the toughest matchup that San Francisco has had to face in like two months. And, and I and I mean that. So and, and here's what I'm saying. It, this isn't an indictment on San Francisco and how I feel about them. I'm saying like this, this is a much tougher matchup. And I'm, I'm going to work backwards here, Luke, so we can just kind of talk about it. Not, not talk about it extensively, but work through the games, okay? So last week they played Seattle, who has been good, but they're not stellar, right? Like their defense isn't great. They beat them 41-23. The week before that, they played the Cardinals. The week before that, they played the Raiders. 37-34 overtime win. The week before that, they played the Commanders, 37-20. Played the Seahawks again, 2013. The week before that, they played the Buccaneers. The week before that, they played the Dolphins. The week before that, they played the Saints. The week before that, they played the Cardinals. Like, you get my point here? Like, they've been on a run. And in the NFL, you've got to win the games that you're supposed to win. But you can't tell me that was a that was a soft, pretty soft schedule overall. And so what I'm saying is they haven't seen a team as good as the Cowboys since they played the Chiefs and lost 44 to 23. I mean, I, I'm be, that, that that that's the truth. Like as a team, Luch, think about this. They haven't seen a team as good as the Cowboys. Since the Chiefs on October 23rd, we're pushing three months since they've seen a legit, like, contender. To that, you say what? I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I played the the Dolphins. Yeah. And the Dolphins, that was like their, what, second road game, I think? Or first road game, second road game. So I get that, but they still won 33-17. And I know I interrupted you, so I'm going to cease from what you say to that. No, I – um, Dallas is tough to, to handicap here. Laying that egg against yeah. Washington was so strange. You know, they won by two touchdowns against the Titans who benched everybody. They beat the Eagles and Gardner Minshew by six. They lost to Jacksonville in overtime. You know, they beat the Texans by like they've been so bad. And before this game, uh, all, no, uh, blah, 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 I can't even talk. Before this week, there was a million questions about Dak Prescott before he went out there and lit up the Buccaneers. So can one game erase all of that uh, recent history? I, I don't know. I That Niners defense is still very, very good. So I think this game's on the uglier side of things. I think San Fran being at home is massive. Um, and then I the, the, the spread is tough. I think I'm with LJ. I would I would take it at three, but no more, just because it's tough to read. Christian McCaffrey being healthy in this scheme with Debo on the way back, getting healthier. Brandon Ayuk and Kittle are playing just fine. <laughs> I mean, that's a scary team. We could talk about Micah Parsons and that Dallas defense. Um, such a big part of Dallas typically succeeding is the run game, and I don't think they're going to be able to run the football against San Francisco. And then it falls on CeeDee Lamb and, and Dalton Schultz and you know Noah Brown and T.Y. Hilton. And I'm sorry, when you're signing T.Y. Hilton in the latter stages of your season, you're, you're struggling. Yeah, you're, you're reaching there a little bit. Um, they're going to have to figure out a way to get Tony Pollard the ball in the air, out of the backfield, some design screens, things like that. Because I think Dak's going to be very one-dimensional, and I see him maybe forcing a few balls here that could get him in trouble like we've seen in previous weeks. That being said, I think Dallas will do some things defensively um, after the first couple of scripted drives that might give Brock Purdy some different looks that he hasn't seen. So I think we're in for a real treat here, but I like Niners. Yeah, I, do I think the Niners are a better team overall? I do. Um, this this one scares me though, man. Like, I think the Cowboys could sneak one here, just by virtue of being a, a better team than I think people probably think because of some of the mishaps they've had. 
And this is definitely going to be the best defense that uh, that Purdy's seen all year. Like, like for sure. So, so what, what are you taking? Are you taking the Niners, or are you scared? Are you hesitantly taking the Niners, or are you just kind of backing off here? Oh, man. I think I'm hesitantly taking the Niners because they're at home, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes a ton of sense. I, I, that's my read. I, I'm hesitantly taking the Niners because they're at home. So do we want to talk about Tampa Bay and Tom Brady? Do we have to? <laughs> let me let me now, ask I mean, you this. Listen, man, it's it's. I think I think it's Tom's time that to hang it up. I, I do. Like, they, he hasn't had the best season. I honestly, I wish Tom would have just retired after the Tampa Bay Super Bowl. Like, I would have loved to just see him go out on top. You know what I mean? Like, just just go out on top, man. Just, just go out on top. I mean. You have a decent amount of weapons. The offensive line's horrible. I think Bruce Arians leaving was a bigger deal than anyone wants to acknowledge. No discredit to Todd Bowles, but Bruce Arians was good, was good at what he what he did, man. So I think he had a lot of stuff going on. The defense was finally healthy, and they played absolutely horrible. The defense has been not the best all season. Uh, I mean, they they had some flashes here, but the defense looked terrible. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about Tom Brady. I really have to evaluate this before I give terrible input. I mean, you have Godwin, you have Mike Evans. You figured you should be able to make some noise. Um, but the offensive line really was just that bad. And uh, and maybe the scheme was. I don't know. Byron Leftwich got canned. Was that deserving? I don't know. How much of the blame's on Leftwich? How much of it's on Brady? How much of it's on the offensive line? How much of it's on Todd Bowles? I I don't know, Chief. It's a lot to digest, and I'd really have to take a couple of days to like look at a lot of stuff. I think. Yeah, man. I I think Tom needs to hang it up. I really do. I think I think this is this is the end. We'll see. It's going to be a an off season of anticipation uh, by the sights and sounds of the betting boards and social media. There's no ink like there's no inkling that Tom Brady's gonna be done though. Everyone's talking about his next team <laughs> already. Um but we'll see what happens. Uh his next team needs to be uh, picking up a Madden controller and playing football at home. Like don't don't get on the field, buddy. He's gonna be broadcasting. He's got that deal lined up, you know. <laughs> oh boy. We got any uh, GPP food of the day or story time? Nah, man, not not currently. I think my GPP food of the day is going to be um, that we. Um, I, I want to come back and talk about this wedding, the, our our uh, catering at our venue uh, at some point. Whenever we we line that up, I think that's going to be a good one. I think that's going to be a good one. All right, cool. Um, I was in Atlantic City for a birthday Saturday, and I know they say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but apparently whatever happens in Atlantic City comes back with you because I've been sick as a dog this whole week. So excuse me if, <laughs> if I'm a little bit uh, more Al Pacino raspy today on the mic. But um, before I felt like complete death, Saturday we did go to – a, a, a pretty, you don't expect to find good barbecue in Atlantic City, but at the Tropicana, there was actually some decent uh, barbecue food. And we stopped at this place called Wild Honey Smokehouse. Uh, it's had some of the best smoke sausage I've ever had. Good stuff there. Uh, it looked, had some good brisket. Uh, the girls had a sp- split amongst a few of them, a 100-ounce party pitcher. So... Um, of uh, some cocktails so definitely a place to uh you know if you want to get the guys fed and get the girls some drinks check out wild honey um smokehouse at the tropicana atlantic city 
it's a win-win for everybody. The girls are happy. The guys get to eat some good smoked food, which you really can't find up north here. I know you got, I know you got smoked food and a barbecue at your disposal down there, Chief. So I can't even go toe to toe with you in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, that's it for now. We'll be back next week. Uh, and again, thanks for. Uh, shout out to Alpha for coming on and giving us some good stuff. You can find him uh, on the Scores and Odds team as well, giving us picks for the NFL playoffs. Chief, anything else before we get out of here? No, nah, man. Thanks for joining us. I think we enjoyed it. Thanks for Alpha Dog for hanging out. And thanks again, folks, for uh, listening and uh, and supporting the pod, man. We, we, we really appreciate it. We definitely do. We wouldn't be here without you guys and gals. And without further ado... Uh, For the Chief and for Alpha, I'm the Looch. Enjoy this week of playoff football and stay well, everyone. Thanks.